Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the kickoff event of uh, Cyber Civilization uh, Research Center. Uh, my name is uh, Jiro Kokurio. I'm uh, Vice President of Keio University, but uh, more than that, I am one of the, uh, the members of uh, uh, this uh, newly uh, created uh, uh, research center. And I am very happy uh, that, that, that to, to report to you that uh, Professor David Farber has uh, arrived uh, to, to lead this uh, institution and that uh, we have the opportunity to have uh, the initial uh, discussion on what we believe to be a, a very, very important topic of how to steer this uniquely large and uh, perhaps uh, 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 some, some risky uh, uh, technologies or the, 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 the new events that's, that's taking place uh, surrounding uh, cyber te technologies. And uh, I hope uh, uh, you, will, you will have a, a fruitful discussion uh, on, on this subject. So thank you. I, I know I'm in, in this burning heat. I mean, I'm, it must be difficult to even get here. So, but I also really appreciate your uh, coming together uh, for, for this event. Uh, I would like, now like to uh, invite our uh, president, uh, uh, Akira Hasayama, uh, to uh, give us a, a, a quick remark. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Keio University, I would like to extend my heartfelt welcome to you all uh, who are gathering here was a kickoff event of Cyber Civilization Research Center, uh, which is a, a newly created institution at Keio Global Research Institute, or KGRI. Uh, KGRI itself was newly created in 2017 as a symbol of Keio University's commitment to contributing to solving issues facing the world alongside our global partners. KGRI is an institute formally established at Keio University to become a platform to organize research activities across traditional disciplinary and organizational boundaries. Cyber Civilization Research Center is a flagship initiative of KGRI to understand and navigate information technologies to benefit humankind. It perhaps goes without saying that information technologies are making profound impacts on all aspects of human society. The center recognizes that the extent of societal transformation is so significant as to warrant description as the emergence of a new cyber civilization. The word civilization has a unique significance for Keio University. Yukichi Fukuzawa, our founder and the most well-known pioneer of Japanese modernization in the latter half of 19th century, recognized that modernization was not simply about steam engines, steel boats, and guns. This was a direct result of his travels overseas, which quickly followed the arrival of Western powers in the Far East. He thus characterized civilization as the enrichment of human society based on the power of knowledge as opposed to physical force in his momentous book, An Outline of the Theory of Civilization. Keio has nevertheless remained an institution with an acute awareness and respect 
for traditional values, including ethics, ever since the days of Fukuzawa. It has meanwhile taken active initiatives to adapt aspects of merit from other cultures as well as cutting edge technologies. KO's motto of independence and self-respect together with Fukuzawa's emphasis on collaborative socialization followed on from Fukuzawa's harsh struggles to reform Japan to become a modern democratic nation. We believe that such history of Keio University puts us in a special position to deeply inquire into the nature of information technologies which pose fundamental questions on the very nature of human autonomy and intellect. We are happy and grateful that Professor David Farber, who is a renowned leader in information technology and its governance, uh, has agreed to become a co-director of Cyber Civilization Research Center. Under his leadership, we are determined to develop a cycle of mutually beneficial interaction between technology and society. I call upon uh, those gathered here to work together to fully leverage these technologies to improve the lives of people around the world. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Um, so, uh, of course, the, 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 the primary event is, uh, is listening today, so you, uh, but as you get prepared, uh, let, let me briefly uh, explain about this, the background of uh, this, uh, this newly created center. Uh, President Hasayama has actually explained uh, uh, the, the most important part of that, but uh, let, me, let me just briefly uh, describe uh, what's, what's happening uh, here, uh, can you my slide here? Okay. So, um, so as uh, as uh, President Hasayama mentioned, uh, the, the actual the organization itself has started in in April of uh, of, of this year, but we are part of uh, Ko uh, Global uh, Research Institute. Uh, which really reflects the, uh, the, the re renewed commitment of uh, KO University to really be part of the solution uh, in the, uh, of the global issues. Of course, I mean, now this is my own take. Um, this is not official KO position. But, uh, but at the same time, if, if I may simplify uh, the, 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 the historical uh, uh, the trends, uh, uh, I mean, since the founding of uh, Keio University in 1858, uh, I think uh, that many people would agree that Keio has played a major role in the adoption of uh, Western civilization uh, to, to the Far East. And uh, as, as uh, President Hasayama mentioned, I, I think it's characteristic that uh, Fukuzawa perceive this uh, as enrichment of, of society uh, rather than uh, anything else. And the question we are facing right now is how we, how we can enrich society uh, with, uh, with the technologies, technology opportunities uh, that, uh, that we have at hand. And of course, uh, after the Second World War, uh, Keio University has really been a major supplier of uh, managers uh, in, in, in companies that have really driven the, the recovery uh, of Japanese economy uh, from the Second World War uh, into uh, this very mature uh, society, maybe excessively so mature society uh, that, that, that we have uh, today. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, sitting on this 
comfortable place. It probably uh, will, will not be uh, allowed <laughs> for, for the future. And uh, so uh, the establishment of uh, KO University Global Research Institute uh, is, uh, is a reflection of our renewed determination to uh, uh, apply the, the power of uh, knowledge and science uh, into uh, solving uh, global, uh, global issues. Uh, that's why uh, in 2016 we have established KO uh, Global Research Institute. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, the, uh, so we, we have, uh, I, I proposed, and uh, of course the director of uh, KO Global Research Institute, uh, Professor Komamura is right there, and he uh, approved uh, that, uh, to, to, that cyber civilization uh, is one of the central topics that uh, we should uh, pursue. Uh, whatever civilization means will be that Dave is going to explain. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think it's everybody uh, who would come, uh, spend their, their time to come here uh, probably agrees that right now uh, we are in, entering in this age which is fundamentally uh, qualitatively whatever, uh, different uh, from, uh, from the, uh, the times we've been living uh, for the last uh, couple of centuries. Uh, and uh, we would really like to know what is happening, and uh, we would really uh, like to steer this uh, adequately, whatever that means. Uh, and Dave is going to answer all of this. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and, and, and that's really the motive uh, for, uh, for, for starting uh, this, this uh, center. And uh, we have uh, uh, assembled from, the, I, mean, we, I really made a point of uh, having a broad uh, base of uh, members uh, uh, from, from all around the university to participate uh, in this uh, effort, and many of the members are here today. Uh, and uh, we would like to expand this, uh, this, this list so that this will become a very large, not necessarily very tightly knit, but sort of a broad community of, uh, of, of researchers who uh, are interested in this and who are ready to collaborate anytime, not just inside, uh, but uh, uh, with uh, researchers around the world. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a starting to uh, develop uh, a group of uh, advisors, uh, and uh, we right now have four. Uh, 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 a very uh, renowned and uh, as, uh, people who are deep thinkers uh, in, this, in this field uh, who are ready to, to help us uh, to, to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion. So uh, let, me, let me, I mean, you ready now? Okay. Uh, so that, that was my brief uh, this explanation of the center, and uh, Dave uh, will explain everything. Everything. <laughs> I just got done with a hour interview, so my throat is beginning to uh, give out, but I'll try. Uh, let's see. Can we go to the next slide? That's what it says. Ah, yes, take a, okay. Yeah, okay. It's hard to define what civilization is, but uh, probably a good description was given by Jiro in a document. Network intelligence, unbounded by physical limits, forces humanity to reconsider the fundamental concepts that have defined civilizations for centuries. We've certainly changed the world over the last 40 years, 35, 40 years, uh, from a world that was basically unconnected largely, even though we had connectivity, we certainly didn't have the type that we have now. And if you look at, oops, if you look at past civilizations, 
quite often sourced by the core technology of that civilization, how you gather wealth, what the wealth mechanisms are, and what the governance structures of it are. If you look at two of the um, traditional, the old civilization, we had an agricultural civilization that came together in city-states, basically, uh, kingdoms, uh, with metal being the, the core technology because we could plow, we could grow things. And in fact, the wealth was the ability to get hold of, of food, store it, market it, etc. And that developed a, a particular type of civilization, largely city-states, uh, largely agricultural, but uh, in the 1800s, and we went on that way for quite a while, actually. In the 1800s, we switched modes because technology has switched on us. Suddenly, the, the core technology was energy, steam energy, electrical energy, a rapid employment, improvement of understanding of physics, understanding of chemistry, and the ability to apply that to the, uh, the world that existed at that point. The wealth was money. People basically um, strove for money and the government and was the marketplace, at least in principle. One could have a big argument of how much, in fact, the government was marketplace and not. Um, I think that I left it out of the slide, but there was another transition which was very, very important. And that's when the first undersea telegraph line was laid between North America, in particular in Europe, that suddenly took two cultures and forced a merger. News was no longer isolated and separated by a week or two of a ship going across. Now, what anybody said was immediately understood by uh, people six, seven, uh, whatever distance apart. And what, what did that change? Well, it certainly changed the world, uh, much to the regret of some people, much to the advantage of other people. We uh, suddenly knew things that we never knew before. Uh, we uh, no longer could have the type of world where we had uh, basically two voices, which I think is one of the fundamental t differences. A politician or leader in pre-telegraph days could give two stories, one to his people and one to the rest of the world. Telegraph made that very difficult. The adding of that to, by the telephone even made it more difficult and when radio came along, it became almost impossible. And that changed a huge number of things. Uh, you know, I guess the old statement is, better you know people, the more you like them. There was also the reverse of that. The more you knew about other people, the less you liked them. Uh, it was always a struggle. The, about 35 years ago, I, someday we'll learn to push buttons. About 35 years ago, I couldn't resist that, John. Uh, a couple of us from the U.S. came over. Uh, it was a seminal event because, in fact, it was uh, the spread of what became, at that point, a very uh, localized technology in the U.S., uh, CSNet in particular, but the notion of tying people together through uh, a computer-mediated really communication. And we came over uh, with tape in hand uh, for those of you who understand this, we were Johnny, Johnny Appleseeds. We had tapes that we planted around the world. And one was planted uh, with Professor Iso and his two graduate students, I believe, at that point. And uh, it became the, the beginning of the uh, Japanese internet. At a similar time, we also shoved the tape in the hands of China, which was less successful, personally and uh, in South Korea, as well as Europe. And suddenly the world now was connected by a different type of communication technology, something that was considerably richer 
than just uh, the telephone, considerably cheaper than just the telephone. The impact of that on the U.S., I think, was particularly notable. Before the, the arrival of this funny technology, uh, we had very limited low-speed communications. Well, yeah, we had acoustic modems. Uh, they were slow. Uh, and in fact, nobody believed they would ever get faster. Uh, for my days in Bell Labs, we used to have to argue that we could, we had 30 board modems that we could do 120, but nobody thought we'd ever need them. Uh, expensive communication used to cost a dollar a minute to cost across, call across the country, and an unknown amount to cost out, call outside the country, and you had to queue up. Computers were things that belonged to big organizations. Uh, very limited international interpersonal communications. And the, the number of people you knew from another culture was relatively small. It was, the airplanes were beginning to, to happen, but uh, there was still not a particular thing that carried the traffic we now carry. When communications increased, we switched mode. Suddenly we have gigabits of data flowing around the world. Uh, and it's not over a few little cables. Uh, notice that Google just put a, bought another cable to Europe, uh, many private cable, uh, fiber optic cables going around the world. It's a log jam almost. The arrival of the wireless space, I think, is particularly notable in changing the culture. When you change the culture, when you turn, change how people interoperate or talk to each other, you fundamentally change many aspects of the civilization. Uh, suddenly now, I'm always connected. You now, this little toy is with me all the time, and if I forget it, I'm in deep trouble. Although my watch does work, at least in the US, I still have to get it working in Japan. Uh, but the, the arrival of, of high, uh, powered computation that's always with me changes almost everything. News is not no longer something I read in the morning. I'm constantly bombarded with it. I'm constantly in social aspect, social connections, quite often with people I have never met, but I feel very close to. And quite often they're in different countries, different parts of my country. It may be next door. I have very little knowledge of that. I just interact with them. And I don't often ask where you are. Uh, the arrival of social networks, <clears throat> which actually dates back fairly far, but uh, has become very popular, is put in a, a whole new way of people communicating, communities communicating, not always for the benefit of mankind, but it's changed things. And then, we, of course, we have cloud computing, et cetera. But you know, I, I like to point out that that's 35 years worth. And we transition. I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be even wilder. This was pretty wild. And I think we've just begun to fight or begun to change things. And it's changing the underlying notions of of civilization, how we deal with each other, how we deal, how we accumulate wealth. What is wealth in the cyber world? Not crystal clear. One of the problems is not crystal clear. So, uh, this is my uh, set of, buried in here are a number of things that I would like to understand better and hopefully uh, one, one, but not all of the research projects we undertake may involve some of these. We have social networks. Their impact has been profound. One could argue that it's been destructive. One can argue it's been constructive. Uh, it certainly has been different. You know, we've, we've changed the way we communicate. We've changed the way we interact. We've had things like false news, which we've always had, by the way. False news is nothing particularly new. It's just that it's much more widespread now. 
we have, more importantly, we built a civilization, and I would call this a civilization, on a vulnerable infrastructure. You know, we, we fundamentally have uh, a very insecure environment that we built it on. It's as if our subways broke down every two minutes, which they damn near do in New York, but that's another story. Uh, that our telephones would go off the air periodically, which they never did. But in fact, our, our current infrastructure is rather weak. I think that's a polite way of saying it. It's the result of a noble experiment. The internet and its uh, development was an experiment. And we didn't get everything right. We got some things wrong, not because we made mistakes, but because it was an experiment. And when you do an experiment, you don't necessarily cover all bases. But that's left us in a very interesting position. Now our critical resources are running over things which have dubious security, to put it mildly. Probably the most difficult thing we've dealt, dealt with now is in our previous civilization, our, our notion of na nation states, basically, which I think are rapidly um, changing. What it develops into, I'm not sure. I hope it doesn't develop into a 1984, for those of you who read the book. Uh, but it could. We have a real difficulty with a lack of international laws that govern some of the rules of living in that civilization. Cybercrime, there is no international laws on. In fact, there are many countries that you cannot prosecute a cybercrime. There are law, lack of understanding of attacks on critical infrastructure. Worse yet, there's a lack of understanding of policy and scenarios of what you would do if you had an, a cyber attack on critical infrastructure. It's not at all clear what some countries would do. Uh, I just point out slightly a sensitive point, but uh, you know, a set of people crashed three airplanes into a set of buildings in New York. Didn't, didn't kill many people. I mean, it was sad that anybody died, but notice that it launched a trillion dollars worth of warfare. Is that going to happen when somebody does a cyber attack, which could be much more damaging than the three buildings? Not at all clear. And then there's a lack of international understandings. So understandings that within, the, uh, within this new culture we have, we've created on personal data. Who owns things about me? Who owns information about my medical records? which are now critical because based on my personal data and, and the medical data, people are making assumptions of, of what I'm going to do in the future, potentially what my children will do, my grandchildren, and uh, who owns that data, who controls it. There's no agreement on that, and yet that could cause us to be uh, in serious trouble in this civilization. And then you know, there are things like cyber currencies, uh, which we have almost no understanding of how to control, or what they do to the economy. You can get two economists in a, in a room together and they'll argue endlessly if they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. I think what shows up here is that the, the things we need on the line, this study, and it's a set of studies, is a multidisciplinary attack. It's not just technologists, it's not just economists, it's certainly not just lawyers. It's, a, it's the ability to bring these people together to look at an evolving world and to try to steer that world, at least try to tell people what the options are and what could happen in the future. And I think that's a very important thing, that, it, that this center is one of the few places I know that's attacking this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to make this uh, event uh, as, as open as possible, and uh, me meaning that I would, uh, I would like to invite a lot of discussion uh, f uh, from the floor uh, after listening to uh, Jun and the Neat. Uh, so please uh, be, be prepared for that. Um, 
And uh, for, for, those, for those of you who would uh, better like to uh, ask questions or make comments in Japanese, I would, uh, I would welcome, I mean, I will do translation, so please, uh, uh, please, please be uh, ready for that. So now I'd like to uh, invite uh, a person who used to be a very young <laughs> Still. Graduate, uh, he's still, still a, a, a very young, um, young at heart. Okay. Okay. Jim Rai. Okay. Yeah, to, Jim Rai. To give your All right. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the KO University. So, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of a follow-up on, uh, you know, the, the, what uh, Dave uh, mentioned, but uh, then you know, I've been working in this space uh, for a long time, and I'm very, very happy that, uh, you know, to welcome uh, Dave Farber uh, in K University. That has been my dream, actually, and, and we've been discussing <laughs> about this for a long time with uh, you know, uh, Hideto Kudasan. Uh, anyway, so, uh, well, actually, the K University is a well-known university to uh, first to think about the internet in this country. Did you know? You, you know who who started the idea of uh, internet in K, at K University for the first time? This part, this person. Look at this. This is an 18, uh, 1866 published uh, Yukichi Fukuzawa's book about the you know the Seiyo Jijo, which is uh, uh, you know affairs in the Western countries. Uh, that uh, I don't know if uh, it's a proper English title or not, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. So uh, he's uh, on, the, on the right after the cover, uh, he's talking about on the right, you know, middle part of the page, he's a four ocean, one family, uh, five uh, tribes and the brothers. So this is a kind of a, a concept of the globe, right? Global space already. And then you know, amazingly, the, on the uh, left pages, uh, there is a art, and the connected by wire, and the hikaku is a hikaku is a person who's a you know career person, right? Career person, and they're running around the world. So this is exactly the internet, right? So uh, he already. Uh, so uh, we, we are proud that uh, you know the K University is a very first university to think about the internet concept. Uh, in probably not in only in Japan, but uh, in this world. Uh, by the way, the 1866 is the first uh, wired uh, communication uh, happened in the uh, Washington to uh, New York. So uh, this is a point to point, and the technology was there, and he showed he saw that technology, but uh, then you know he instantly uh, had the images of uh, connecting the world together. That is uh, amazing. Uh, you know, inspiration uh, for this. But uh, then after that, then the you know, cyber civilization uh, exists. But it's actually the start of the internet. And uh, then the you know, internet, therefore, uh, naturally, when we are, uh, you know, kind of pioneering, uh, they've visited, we saw the picture, but when the, they visited with the Lali Land River and the, together with the Tokudasa, at uh, that time, then, uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, uh, we were working on a, in a CS net, computer science network around the world, and which is a kind of by extending the concept of the ARPANET to the world uh, by National Science Foundation. Uh, fund. So uh, this is, uh, that was the very beginning of the global space uh, interconnected together. So uh, that was uh, uh, the real internet uh, beginning. But internet techno as a technology, then it's uh, uh, we decided to employ the uh, original ARPANET uh, technology for connecting the thing. But the international connection concept was uh, started by Dave and uh, then they were working together with us. So the internet is uh, basically uh, very simple. The internet protocol, uh, exterior gateway protocol, interior gateway protocol, which is uh, basically the how the, uh, the IP uh, internet uh, protocol packet uh, is gonna be a carry out through the world, right? And then in order to reach that, then the ID is the IP address globally, 
the global unique ID to the, each of the computer, and uh, then the DNS, the domain name system to, re to get the uh, IP address. Uh, so very simple system. But uh, you have to know that the uh, internet is a capitalized. I is uh, capitalized, which is a single entity in the world. So this is a global space again. So as uh, Yukichi Kuzao sensei uh, picture, uh, as a you know, kind of global one and a single network. Uh, so this is exactly the concept of the internet. So we do have a global space. And uh, then you know, this is a very simple, so but not be beyond that. I just came back from the Mangamura session in the government, the copy pilots of uh, mangas, and uh, then it's a big fight. Uh, so I was afraid that I'm gonna be late in this one. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, that's also the very interesting discussion uh, following that, that the internet is a connecting beyond the border of the nations, and uh, then the you know, web is a kind of a platform for the, any application and the services to sit on it, and uh, then a the, you know, smartphone uh, coming in, and uh, therefore the, any services uh, can be uh, created with a very, very uh, low cost uh, uh, investment. So uh, that uh, in any kind of services, if you have an idea of uh, uh, you know whatever the creation, uh, you you have a dream, you have an issue to solve, then it's uh, very easy uh, to utilize the software and then you know creating the solution with a global space. So remember, the internet is uh, still the global space, and we don't uh, recognize actually the boundary of the nation when we were developing the internet, which is. Uh, Again, equal to the Yukichi Fukuza Sensei's concept right, on the picture. So, but uh, now it's uh, for everyone. So uh, this is a cyber, cyber civilization coming in. And uh, so everything, uh, we can utilize the internet, we can utilize the digital data, we can utilize um, the technology. So that's a cyber uh, civilization concept. So uh, we do have a, a cyber space, which is uh, created by the internet as a kind of a global space and also the local space, which is that uh, we have a legal space, we have an uh, economy, we have its own culture, language, and other things. So uh, there is a boundary, the nation, and the nation and the nation can negotiate with a place like a United Nation, right? And uh, then, uh, so uh, it's a nation space is a real space, and we have a legal, we have a, a court, we have a government, uh, but the global space, on the cyberspace, we don't. Uh, we don't have an owner of the cyberspace. We don't have a government of the cyberspace. We don't have a police of the uh, cyberspace. Okay, now, it's a completely merging together. That's uh, basically what we call a cyber civilization uh, you know, uh, space. So uh, that's gonna create a lot of confusion, including the, when I was uh, attending about, uh, say, uh, the pilots of the manga uh, contents on the internet, you know, that's about the nation and the, our own local uh, regulation. But it's happening on the cyberspace, therefore no boundary on the nation. So uh, it's gonna make uh, people uh, very much uh, confused and uh, then you know, it's uh, difficult to understand. So, so that's, that's a lot of issue as uh, Dave mentioned. Uh, uh, in front of us, but uh, then you know, probably it's uh, really the time to think about the assumption of this kind of a two spaces merging together. That's the assumption to everybody, to every indus industry, to every place in, on the earth. Then you know, that's happening uh, today. And uh, therefore we have to work for the future of uh, this uh, merged space of a cyberspace and the real space, and uh, also the nation and the global space as well, so uh, that's uh, very difficult, but the, uh, the important thing is uh, we can't solve, we can't work on this uh, with a kind of a single segment of the uh, study, right? And uh, we can't work on the technology alone, we can't work on the economics alone, we can't work on the you know, legal law alone. So uh, it's a kind of, uh, it's a very important that uh, working with uh, you know, all the stakeholders and all the experts on this area has to work together. So the, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, issues, but then, the, you know, the, probably the internet has, 
has been, you know, the very interesting uh, uh, technology for the economy, right? The money and the, you know, then convenience and the, uh, but the now uh, we can, we are started to uh, discuss about the abusing of the, the this uh, fantastic technology, and uh, then you know what is the opposite of abuse and the, then the ethical use of the technology. So uh, can we create the you know that kind of uh, uh, civilization? Right? Uh, you know, hopefully the ethical use uh, is uh, you know, more, but uh, we have to. Find out and understanding about the abuse as well. So, I'm going to stop with this, this point. I have a uh, hundred more slides, but, but uh, as usual, but uh, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think it's safer to stop you here. You, you can come back. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, truly young. Uh, scholar that uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really we are we are also really happy uh, to have uh, welcomed uh, uh, arrived at uh, Keio University uh, who is uh, uh, Danit uh, Gao uh, and and uh, for those of you who many of you may know her already uh, through her very active uh, engagement uh, in really thinking about the uh, some of the threats of artificial intelligence as well as benevolent uh, use of, uh, of the technology. And uh, she, she's really adding a new, I mean, we, we have the two world's guru on, on, on internet, but uh, of course uh, we are, as, as, I mean, artificial intelligence uh, really is, is a symbolic example of some of the new developments that, that, that's taking place uh, in, in, in the cyberspace. And that uh, we are really very happy to have her add uh, a new perspective and stimulus uh, to our discussion. And uh, she is uh, really uh, organizing uh, some, some of the discussions. Uh, I mean, agenda setting is actually is, uh, one of the uh, critical things uh, we need to do and that uh, she's been helping us with our struggles. We're still pretty chaotic right now, isn't it? But uh, can, can you explain our thinking as of right now? Thank you. Okay, so this presentation has two aims. One is to really help acquaint you with the themes of the research that we would like to pursue. And the second one is to inspire you to bring your own ideas and perspectives into this. You've heard from both Dave and June and Jiro and President Hasayama really about the different things that they're thinking about. But we have a room full of people who are vested in this in interest, in this idea. And I really want to kind of help you understand where that takes you. So the first theme is the implications of connectivity on civilization, society, and the self. And that really centers around how do we create inclusive social benefit by using connective technologies. They say that an image speaks a thousand words. And the idea here is that it will speak a thousand words to each and every one of you. This is a depiction of fake news. Um, how basically your ability to connect and amplify the information that you deliver gets distorted in the middle, so that even when we exchange information, it loses its accuracy, loses its value. Um, this is also true, as Dave said, for rumors, for a lot of other things, but I think it's a very nice depiction of where connectivity technology were used to transform information and transport it can go wrong. And this is just one example of the implications that they can have on society. You can really take it anywhere you want. The third, uh, sorry, the second theme is the virtual and physical infrastructure security in a connected age. And Dave spent a lot of time on this because I think it is indeed a very critical problem. And the question is, how do we protect virtual and physical infrastructures from cyber threats? Here you have a really nice, peaceful image of a lot of grids, a lot of infrastructure connected together. So you have air travel, you have transportation, you have water in the middle, you have power grids needed for the city. Uh, windmills as well. Just imagine how well they work together in unison when they're all connected. 
It really helps us make the most out of the ability to connect the grids. However, this also makes them very vulnerable because people would often go for electricity grids. They would go for water grids. What happens if someone breaks into the windmill and through that enters the system? We have a lot of weaknesses that we need to consider and all of this nice serene image could go dark within an instant. We need to think about that. The third theme is cyber civilization risk and resilience. And the question is, what are the large scale risks to cyber civilization and how do we develop resilience against them? What are the things that we should be thinking about and how can we actually provide any kind of remedy in anticipation of that? And here I think is an image that obviously looks very pleasing in terms of CGI, but also kind of helps people imagine what it would look like to have that kind of cyber civilization. It's almost a space that encompasses the earth, is invisible to us, but it is ubiquitous, it is pervasive, it is everywhere. And if you look at the kind of story that this image is telling you, then on the light side, you have a very clear net protecting you from what you know. But on the dark side, it starts to fade out and you can't really tell what's going to happen and the net is not very comprehensive it cannot protect you and these are the things that we think about what are the things that are going to affect us what are the things that we are going to have to deal with and how can we make sure that just like this net kind of orbits around the earth we could be able to provide an environment that would secure the civilization that we would like to protect Another thing that I would like to point your attention towards is that Earth is in the center, but the network around it is much bigger. This is the potential that we have to create new services, to create new connections, to create new knowledge. This is the ability that we have by virtue of using the technology. This is just a glimpse of the potential we have to really amplify our ability to live. Thank you. Thank you.